Now, so Alexei, tell us again what you were referring to about uh, Yulia Tymoshenko and uh, her potential freedom from a prison hospital in Kharkov. Yes, we do know that the Ukrainian parliament ratified a law which would set Yulia Tymoshenko, the archival of President Yanukovych, the former prime minister, from prison. But we do know that she is still in a prison hospital in the city of Kharkov, which is now under the control of the police. But that's also a contradiction here because the parliament has officially appointed the new interior ministry of the country, of the country one of the figureheads of the protest movement here at the Euromaidan, and he already stated that the police is now on the side of the opposition and on the, of the people. The army, uh, the uh, armed forces of Ukraine are still pretty much suggesting that they are neutral. They're not on anybody's side. They have the control. Uh, the the um, commander in chief uh, said that he has the control uh, over uh, the servicemen all everywhere across uh, the country. So they're not joining any part of this conflict at the moment. Meanwhile, in the streets of Kiev, it's certainly uh, very unclear where this is all going because there's simply no control in the capital city. All the government buildings are now under control of the uh, protesters. Some bizarre pictures are coming in from the residents of Viktor Yanukovych where people are literally playing golf on his grounds, throwing his documents into the water and uh, taking pictures on into their Instagram. So definitely it's hard to say where the situation is going. but. For now, the president is defined. He will not be resigning. Whether this will infuriate the people here at the Maidan even more, we, of course, will have to wait and see. All right. Thank you very much for that update, RT's Alex Arashevsky, live for us in Kiev, Ukraine. So areas that are now saying they'll govern themselves are key to Ukraine's economy. Southern and eastern Ukraine, comprising 10 regions, it's home to just over half the country's populace, 23 out of 45 million. The territory, including large areas of fertile land with enormous agricultural potential and also the country's industrial heartland with most of the mines and factories. And there's also Ukraine's ports situated there in Odessa and, Ukraine, or Odessa and Crimea. France, Germany and Poland, meanwhile, have admitted that the Ukrainian opposition has failed to comply with the deal they helped broker with the government. The Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, says the president's opponents have been used as puppets by extremists to pose a direct threat to Ukraine's sovereignty. He called on the EU to force the opposition, which has been supporting up till now, to take control over the radicals on the streets. Mark Sloboda, a senior lecturer in international relations at Moscow State University, thinks the crowd is playing by its own rules. Agreement that was uh, agreed to on Friday between uh, the uh, supposed leaders uh, of the opposition, who actually have no control over what uh, the Maidan mobs are doing at this point, who is actually in control on the ground. There has been uh, a coup. The um, deal agreed to has been broken. Um, and the Congress in Kharkov has uh, declared that any decisions taken by this parliament now have been taken uh, without the participation of the majority of the party of regions and communist delegates, and that uh, any of its decisions are invalid because they have been made under threats of violence uh, and death by the mobs that were literally sieging the parliament and are now in physical control of it. Political analyst and Ukraine specialist Bruno Jevsky says Ukraine is veering toward a power vacuum. I think that the Yanukovych camp is uh, more and more divided, and I think that Yanukovych made quite a lot of errors, so it's not sure he will be uh, still the leader of the, let's say, uh, anti, anti Maidan camp. There are too many leaders in the opposition, and Timoshenko will be one, of, one, one more. So I, I don't really. Um, uh, see how the opposition can be still united, especially that we, we observe very strong differences between the, uh, you know, the Maidan um, uh, people and uh, the leaders of the opposition. So I think that in the next uh, weeks we will uh, see maybe strong differences inside the opposition. We're following the situation in Ukraine on air and online. We have crews in Kiev and in Kharkov in the east. And remember, you can check out their updates on our Twitter feed for the latest. I heard earlier from an activist, an organization. Uh, let's listen to this short soundbite from one of those radical leaders. As long as I live, I will fight against Jews, communists, and Russian scum. 
Now that is an activist from the right sector, an organization that will be incorporated with the police, according to one of the opposition leaders. As a former police officer, do you think that's someone you'd want joining the ranks of law enforcement? I think your question is rhetorical because it's really clear that these kind of people um, who are advocating, if you like, this street violence, even yesterday, uh, in uh, deep inside one BBC broadcast was an activist being interviewed who said that um, they didn't want, for example, Yanukovych to be tried or anything like this. They just wanted him killed. And um, this seemed to come as some shock to uh, a media which uh, really it's notable uh, to point out that for weeks the media uh, in the West, certainly in the UK and the US, has backed unreservedly um, these protests that have been taking place. Uh, and it's really only that in the last 24 hours or so that uh, as the situation in Ukraine has, has predictably started to unravel, that the media here and even government figures have started to question the makeup of at least some of these protesters, including the fact that as we've seen on our own television screens uh, unavoidably over the last uh, 48 hours and longer, that many of them are heavily armed. It's also clear that there, um, I think we can see from the rapid scale of what might be called defections amongst police, um, the neutrality, shall we say, of the armed services uh, in this, um, or at least the reluctance of the armed services to intervene in uh, what is, after all, a public order security situation within Ukraine, um, can be seen, if you like, almost as a mutiny. And it may well be that there has been activism, uh, perhaps from the far right, uh, because it's notable that Svoboda, the um, uh, far right party uh, that is quite well represented on the streets, uh, also was a party to this agreement uh, of the 21st of February uh, to chart a political way forward. Uh, for Ukraine. So uh, at least normally Svoboda has signed up to this agreement um, and yet it's also clear that um, uh, there may have been some form of negotiations, some sort of activism going on behind the scenes with links with various political groups uh, to the armed forces and perhaps even within the police itself. Certainly in the west of Ukraine that wouldn't be a surprise. Why do you think that opposition leaders, mainstream opposition leaders, haven't been able to rein in the more extremist factions that are out on the streets? simply because they are not aligned politically and, and never have been. I think it's fair to say uh, that at certain points, uh, the majority of the demonstrators, uh, certainly at an early stage, were uh, uh, representing a very wide uh, spectrum of society. And one must remember what the uh, protests were about. Uh, these protests were not as they've been billed in the West um, uh, about democracy. These protests were initially about uh, uh, Russia, uh, 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 rather about Ukraine deciding uh, not at least in the uh, immediate future, to have a trade association with the EU. They were then protests about corruption, and there are, of course, issues of corruption uh, within Ukraine, as there are in many countries. Um, and then there, were, uh, uh, there was upset about the degree to which the 2004 Constitution has been subverted. All of these were issues and are issues that are widely shared amongst many uh, Ukrainians, particularly those of a, of a Western, uh, shall we say, more pro-European allegiance. Um, but really also at the same time there has been a very hardcore of these protesters and these have been visible on our television screens despite what the commentary has been saying. People who actually, um, uh, for right or wrong, reject uh, in many ways a democratic agenda in any case. And uh, also of course it should be remembered that much of the right wing is quite, high, quite well represented within Ukraine, even within the democratic process. And so it's not clear at all that the people now that have rejected uh, after all, the four main political parties democratically elected within Ukraine uh, in the last uh, parliamentary elections. All of these four parties were represented in the agreement uh, of yesterday, uh, charting a political roadmap forward for Ukraine, including Yukonovich. But that has now been rejected by uh, those on the street. And of course, those on the street are now largely being supported by the army and the police. And of course, that brings into question the terminology that should be applied here. Is this a coup? Is this a revolution? Certainly it doesn't appear democratic at this stage. All right, Charles Shoebridge, thank you for your time.
UK trade unions coming up. UK trade unions coming up hard against the government as they organize new strikes and state claim for workers' rights in tough financial times. Artis Tessar Cilia reports from London. Below the surface, there is a burning anger and frustration. And that fury has led to a storm of anti-government criticism. Take the recent flooding, for instance. Unions say Downing Street's cuts meant lower budgets for flood maintenance and staff. Unions haven't been able to do much whenever the job axe was wielded, but once in a while, they score a point. When two workers go on strike, London grinds to a halt, quite literally. Now, for two days in February, that's exactly what happened, and trade unions were the talk of the town. For them, it was a fight for hundreds of jobs. But business leaders said the strike cost the London economy 200 million pounds. Prime Minister David Cameron branded the walkout as shameful. What's shameful is these vicious attacks on all the people, virus database the has been updated. Society. They want to beat wages down so that their friends can make bigger profits. Trade union members have gathered here in what they say is a show of resistance to the government's continued austerity cuts. Now, unions have seen their numbers grow for the first time in a decade, reaching 6.5 million members in 2012. In the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher's government went head-to-head -head with unions, introducing legislation that essentially made it more difficult to carry out strike action. And not much has changed since then. And one of the first actions they took when they came to office back in 2010 was to change the rules on uh, eligibility to claim unfair dismissal. Previously, um, you had to be working for your current employer for just 12 months. They changed that to two years. The government is keen to undermine workers' rights. Businesses, though, beg to differ. Historically, um, various unions have pretty much held the British government to ransom. Things like increasing the minimum wage and introducing a living wage. They actually increase unemployment. They make it more difficult for employers to take on new people. The second plan to walk out of the month was called off at the last minute after concessions were made and talks resumed. Score for the unions this time but as more cuts loom, workers plan their move, and the next round could very well be just right around the corner. Tessa Celia RT, London.